Good evening, my name is Grace Hayek and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to our webinar on photographer Antoine Severgan. Tonight's program is being recorded and will be put on the library's YouTube channel within a few days. You're encouraged to put your questions into Q&A and I will ask them on your behalf at, toward the end of the program. Closed captioning is enabled for those who want it. Um, this visiting professors program is sponsored by the Friends of the Glencoe Public Library. Thank you, friends. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our presenter. Tasha Vorderstrasse is the curator of the current exhibit, Antoine Sevrugin, Past and Present, which will be on display at the Oriental Institute through December 23rd. In our newsletter, we had said it was uh, going to be up until December 31st, but that was just changed. So um, if you want to see it in person, you need to get down there quickly. Um, there is a virtual exhibit, though, that um, Tasha will explain about um, that you can also visit online if you don't have time to get down to the Oriental Institute before the 23rd. The, the virtual exhibit will be on display for longer than that. Um, Ms. Vorderstrasse is um, the University and Continuing Education Program Coordinator at the Oriental Institute and received her PhD in Near Eastern Archaeology from the University of Chicago in 2004. Ms. Vorderstrasse, we're so, so pleased to have you here tonight. Go ahead and get started. Great. Thank you so much. I'll go ahead and share my screen. And then, all right. And thank you so much for uh, the introduction. Uh, and also for me, it's great to be here and virtually that is, uh, and to talk about the Antoine Severgin uh, exhibition. Uh, and as I was telling Grace beforehand, and some of you were here already, uh, this is actually, as far as I know, the last uh, sort of programming I'm gonna be doing in relation to the exhibition as far as presentation. So this is also um, it, you know, very nice for me as well to have an opportunity to talk about this material. Um, again, having immersed myself quite a bit in Severgin over the last few years. So um, as Grace mentioned, the uh, uh, special exhibition at the OI Museum, Antoine Severgin, Past and Present, will be on through the 23rd of December. Um, but there is a virtual exhibition. So that's, it's the entire exhibition, which uh, I put up uh, virtually on the OI website. And I did that because I knew, um, of course, due to COVID and a lot of people can't travel either you know, within or to the United States and wouldn't be coming necessarily to Chicago in person, I wanted to make sure that as many people were able to view the exhibition as possible. And so indeed, if you don't have an opportunity to go to the exhibition before, um, then we will you know, have this up and you'll be able to take a look uh, that way. Um, but basically what I wanted to do this evening was take you through the exhibition, but also talk about a number of things about Antoine Severgin, who um, was really a fascinating individual and really I think encapsulates sort of the end of the 19th beginning of the 20th century and sort of the changing world in which he lived and how he documented it. Um, so Antoine Severgin uh, is a uh, Iranian photographer, uh, Armenian Iranian, so of Armenian descent um, and really it was in the 1990s that um, people started rediscovering him um, and his work. So this started with uh, Antoine Severgin, and my apologies, my cats have decided that they're going to fight now. So if you hear cat noises in the background, that's my cat, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, so um, Antoine Severgin in the Persian image, which was at the uh, Fleur Sackler, uh, museum uh, in 1999. And this was really the first exhibition that focused on Severgin and really introduced his photography to the ge more general public. Um, at the same time, there was also a publication of the photographs in the National Museum of Ethnology in Leiden. So again, another group of Severgin pictures came out. And through time, we've seen Severgin appear in a variety of museum exhibitions, including the Eye of the Shah exhibition at the uh, at ISA in 2015-2016. Uh, so that was his work was part of this wider exhibition looking at Kajar. Uh, photography. Uh, so the Qajar period is the period that we're talking about here, that when Iran was ruled by the Qajar dynasty and Severgin uh, was uh, active at that time. And then uh, there was also in 2017-2018 at the Harvard Art Museum's Technologies of Image Art in 19th Century Iran. So this was really sort of building on this. And Severgin was a photographer who I was familiar with, um, but it wasn't until 
several years ago um, that I discovered we actually had Severgeen uh, photographs in the collection of the OI. The OI is better known as a museum of uh, ancient objects from the Middle East and North Africa, um, but we also have later period material. We have a very nice uh, Islamic archaeological collection, but I didn't know that we had the Severgeen uh, prints until quite recently, and it then came to me that it might be interesting to do an exhibition on this material. So I did a short article in News and Notes. Um, and really one of the things that I wanted to look at uh, in the exhibition and sort of talk about was who was Severgeen and what was it that he was trying to do? So why, why do the photographs look the way they do? Why is he photographing what he is? And Severgeen is a very interesting person who because of his complicated background, which we'll talk about shortly, has been identified as many different things. And you can see this list. He is, in fact, not most of these. Um, but indeed, you know, as you can see, the opinions about who Severgeen was vary widely. So scholars were already sort of unclear about his sort of background, uh, his cultural background. But basically, uh, we don't know exactly when he was born, but the current uh, feeling, uh, which was put forth by uh, Stacy Shywiller, which was that uh, Antoine Severgeen was born around 1851 in the Russian embassy in Tehran. So he was actually. Um, Armenian, but of descent from some people who had come from the Russian Empire. So, uh, which is, I think, interesting because there are Armenians in Iran. There's still Armenians in Iran today, but he was not actually descended from that specific community. After his father died, his mother and his siblings, he and his siblings returned to the Russian Empire. So they returned to what is now Georgia and then Nakhchivan, what is now Nakhchivan in Azerbaijan, and then ultimately uh, found their way to, uh, he found his way to Tbilisi uh, in what is now Georgia, where he first studied painting, and then he studied uh, photography with Dmitry Ermakov, returning in the 1870s to, uh, to Iran, establishing first a photography studio in Tabriz in Northwest uh, Iran, and then a photographic studio in Tehran, and became an official court photographer to the uh, ruler of Iran, Nasr al-Din Shah. He married an Armenian Iranian, so an Armenian from the Iranian community, and they had a number of children. Um, and ultimately, a lot of his glass plate negatives were destroyed or confiscated. Uh, the remaining ones that he ended up getting back uh, are now in, again in the first Sackler collection. So clearly, just this very short overview gives you an idea of a very exciting life. So um, as I mentioned, there was a large Armenian community in Iran, so you can see here. Um, and uh, they moved a lot of them from the Jolfa area in what is now Nakhchivan and moved them to uh, ultimately to uh, Isfahan uh, and the suburb of New Jolfa, where today you can see a lot of Armenian churches. Um, there were in Tbilisi, which was known as Tiflis in this period, a large number of Armenians already. So when uh, Severgin was there, he was one of many Armenians living in this area. And Again, there were Armenians in Agulis where he was. So basically you have these Armenian communities that Severgin is moving between as he's training first as a painter and then as a photographer. So Dmitry Ermakov, who taught him his uh, painting, you can see here, so this is a self-portrait of him. He actually also worked in Iran, so he took pictures of Nasr al-Din Shah as well. Um, and there's some idea potentially that Severgin may have gone to Iran to open up a studio on Ermakov's behalf, although he ultimately became independent. Um, so Ermakov took a lot of different pictures too. And we can see, uh, if we look at his, his photography, that he influenced Severgin in the ways of which the, paint, the photography is staged. You can see here uh, the way the figures are standing. And as we'll see, and you'll be seeing a lot of pictures of Severgin, uh, that he is very meticulous in his staging. It's clear that he really wanted to be in control of what he was doing and everything is planned and you'll see that and it's really quite amazing what he does. So in the beginning of the exhibition that you saw, I sort of give a brief overview of his life and then we move into talking about the different photographs that we have and the different categories of those photographs. So as you can see here, we have a section that's devoted to the royal family. Uh, that is to say, the Qajar royal family. So Nasr al-Din Shah was the ruler of uh, Iran between 1848 and 1896. Um, so not the entire time that Severgin was active as a photographer, but much of it. And 
Nasser Din Shah himself was an enthusiastic amateur photographer. And this is one of the reasons why he sponsored all these pho photographers himself. So he took his own pictures. We can see that here. Um, but he also understood that photography was excellent as a propaganda tool to convey what he, and you can see him here on his hunting trip, uh, wanted to convey about his dynasty himself and sort of the Qajars in general. So he was very conscious of this, the need to document everything and the idea that you could then use that documentation to further your own ends. Now he was assassinated, so one can argue perhaps he was not entirely successful, but he certainly had this idea. So one of the things that Severdine did in addition to taking pictures, as you saw, of Nasser al-Din Shah was he also took lots of pictures of Qajar monuments. Um, so we can see some of these here. So this is one of the thrones in the palace uh, in Tehran. Uh, and also we have this picture here. This was a picture, this was a statue of Nasser al-Din Shah, which was basically, he was on horseback. Um, and this was part of Nasser al-Din Shah's desire for modernization. So he really wanted to modernize Iran and very much took influences from uh, Europe in order to do that. So not just in terms of photography, which he you know, sponsored and was very enthusiastically promoting, but also in terms of Western style things such as uh, equestrian statues. Now this statue was supposed to go up in Tehran itself, but some religious scholars objected. So in the end it was banished to the Shah's garden, but of course, you know, Severgin is still photographing it. So people are still going to see this. They're still going to know what this is and associate this uh, with, uh, with the Qajar dynasty and sort of the power of the Qajar dynasty at, at just as the throne uh, does. Um, and it's not just a matter of photographing, you know, sort of the royal family and the accoutrements of the royal family, but also photographing um, incidents which involve the royal family in this case. So as I mentioned, Nasser Dean Shah was assassinated. And this is a picture of his, uh, basically of his funeral. So you can see here, um, basically this, this particular photograph by Severgin uh, documenting important you know, sort of events in the life of the dynasty, as it were. Now, we can also see in the collection, the majority of the, of the pictures in the collection that the OI has, and I'll be talking about the collection in a little bit, but the majority of the collection that the OI has are pictures of Severgin, by Severgin. Almost all the pictures are by him. But there are some pictures by some other people, some of them were anonymous, so I don't know who they are, but in this case, we do know. So this... These, and I think this also illustrates what Severdeen was doing and how his vision is very different, right? So how he's actually photographing things in a very unique and special way that sets him apart from other photographers at the time. So on the left, you have Severgin's photograph of Mirza Reza Kermani, the assassin of Nasser Din Shah. And on the right, you have a picture of the same scene, probably done pretty much at the same time, judging by the individuals and how they look, uh, by Abdullah Mirza Qajar. So Abdullah Mirza Qajar is a member of the Qajar royal family so the, and a photographer. So this is, again, talking about how the Qajar royal family is so bound up in photography to the point that they actually have um, members of that family, you know, who themselves, not just the Shah himself, but, but members of the family who are photographers and who produce photographs that people could purchase, because obviously the Shah's photographs were for himself. So if you compare these pictures together, what you can see is something very interesting going on. So if you look at Mirza Reza Kermani on the left in the Severgin photograph, it's very intense, right? He's looking straight at you, right at you. And he looks not entirely well, perhaps, very intense. Um, and it's almost secondary that he's in chains, right? So he has a chain, he has all these chains, but you can't really see them very well. They're not emphasized. He's sitting in such a way that it's not entirely obvious. And you actually have to look fairly carefully at the picture to realize that he is, in fact, a prisoner, right? So initially you just see this super intense guy looking right at you um, and you're sort of like, well, you know, what's going on? And then you look and you're like, oh, he's in chains. But if you then turn to the picture by Abdullah Mirza Qajar, it's much different, right? 
Um, in this case, Mirza Reza Karmani is in the background, so he's very much behind his guard, and the chains are extremely prominent. So he's almost sort of being led by this guard, right? And you really get this, don't get a sense of who he is as a person. He's just kind of there. Um, and so it's a very different approach. With the first one, with Sever Gaines, you feel like you almost sort of know this person, right? And then when you hear he's the Shah's assassin, you're not at all surprised to find this out. Um, but the other one is kind of like, oh, it's some prisoner and you have no sense of this person and no sense of their sort of intensity, right? And so this was one of the things that I thought was very useful was really to show these pictures next to each other as they are in the exhibition. So you're seeing them as, as they would appear on the wall um, to really give people the sense of the fact that what Severgeen is doing is really unique. Uh, and I think ultimately informed through the fact that he was trained as a painter. So he had a very interesting use as we'll see of things like light, shadow, and also in terms of sort of thinking about trying to bring the characters of the people that he's photographing to the fore, even though we don't always know who they are, although in this instance, we do. And indeed, one of the things that Severgeen does is he really, you know, is paying attention to his composition of his photographs. Um, and this is from the uh, catalog. This is from the article by Carissa Johnson, who's a professional photographer. And the reason that I asked her to do a catalog entry, and this catalog is free to download uh, on the, uh, from the OI, the, I wanted somebody who was a professional photographer to actually talk about what it was that Severgeen was trying to do, because I, as a uh, academic who is not a professional photographer, um, can talk about sort of what I think he's doing, but I don't know the sort of techniques and the technology that's behind it. And so really, it's clear that Severgeen was paying a lot of attention to the way he put his pictures uh, together. And Indeed, you know, this was not easy to do at the time, right? So, I mean, we know that, you know, these people did have to sit still. Uh, at this time, you didn't have to sit still as long as you did for daguerreotypes, but still, you know, we know how hard it is to stand still even for a couple seconds when someone snaps our picture with an iPhone, um, let alone to stand, sit still for a number of seconds, right? So this was, you know, these were, these were not necessarily easy things to do. We have some idea of Severgeen's pic, uh, pictures. All the pictures that we have in the collection, these are album imprints and would have been taken uh, on a camera with glass plate negatives. You can see, here's a picture of, a, of the camera. This is at Persepolis and this is in the first Sackler collection, but we can't of course see the camera. We don't know uh, precisely what camera he was using, um, but we do have uh, some indication of him. You can see him here in, and you can see them with the, with the, with the cam camera in the, in the uh, basically this is in a reflection in a mirror. And also you get the sense of here's Severgeen, uh, in case you're wondering who's being executed in the background, that's actually Mirza Reza Kermani, who we just saw. Um, so Severgeen's shadow is actually here. Um, and you can see basically, again, this camera, also the fact that he seems to have had an assistant, uh, probably one of the, his family members, we know that they, uh, they helped him. Um, so we don't necessarily know the type of camera he was using, but we have sort of a sense of what it would have been. So if we then move to the next sort of section, and this is the biggest section of the, of the prints, you might notice that these are not the original prints. We'll, we'll look at those in a little bit, but for conservation reasons, we couldn't put out a large number of original prints or certainly hang them on the wall. So these are actually reproduction uh, pictures of the pictures we have in the collection. Um, and that's why some of them are different sizes. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about in this section was how Severgeen was documenting a changing Iran. So I've already sort of referred a little bit to Nasruddin al Shah's attempts to modernize Iran. So this was something that, you know, basically Severgeen wanted to document Iran in all of its aspects. So this meant historical Iran, so this archaeological ruins, ancient buildings, but also modern buildings, but as well as we'll see, he wanted to document modernity because Iran was becoming a modern state at this point. And he wanted to show that. Now, this was very much in contrast to the Western European and uh, North American 
travelers who would come to places like Iran and also elsewhere in the Middle East and North Africa who had very Orientalist ideas about what it was they were seeing. That is to say, they very much wanted landscapes that were not full of people, you know, these sort of unchanging landscapes, or if people were in them, they wanted them basically there as props, as scale, this kind of thing. And they had no interest in a modern Iran. And indeed, we have accounts, travelers' accounts, which bemoan the misery of the fact that they think Iran is getting too modern, and they urge people to quickly visit before it's too late. And we'll look at one thing they found particularly objectionable shortly. So what I wanted to do here was really give a sense of an overview of Severgin's uh, work documenting Iran in all these different aspects. So, and not just the monuments, but also the ethnographic types, his friends and so forth. Um, and also at the same time, give you more of a sense of his photographic uh, technique and his unique style. So a lot of the pictures that we'll see shortly, particularly the ethnographic uh, pictures, were actually photographed inside the Cannon Square, which was the parade ground uh, in Tehran. And we'll see sort of how he plays with that uh, in a moment. You'll also note uh, the tramway tracks uh, going past um, this was something that in particular uh, visitors to uh, Iran found objectionable. They disliked the tramway intensely uh, and talked about that. Uh, so, because again, it didn't fit in with their view of this sort of unchanging ancient landscape, this kind of thing, right? So, but Severgin was not afraid to take pictures which included these modern things, which of course for Western European and North American travelers was something that they tended to avoid. So this is the interior of the square. Again, taken by Severgin, he's standing on the roof, taking this down. Um, and so what he did with his photographs was he actually arranged people in these groups to make it look as if there were far more of them than there were. So you can see with the baggage handlers here, it looks like they're part of this giant line of baggage handlers, but in fact, they're probably the only ones here. The other thing that he's done is he's having them look in all sorts of different directions. And further, you'll note, there's no shadow. Now, how Severgin achieved this was he would either take things at noon, where apparently just shadow is you know, much less. He would also use you know, sheets and various lighting. He was apparently very much inspired by Rembrandt. Remember, he trained as, had trained as a painter, so he was very familiar with this. And he really disliked shadows and tried to avoid them um, whenever possible. And this creates an even more striking image. What's also interesting here is that you'll note uh, Severgain's interest in the use of blank space. So you'll see, you can kind of vaguely see the outline of the parade ground buildings in the background, but really it just all sort of seems to stretch forever and they almost seem to be floating uh, in space here. So it's a very striking image. And indeed, if we compare this to the uh, Abdullah Frères, uh, who are operating out of, uh, primarily out of Constantinople, and that is modern Istanbul, though they also had a uh, office in Cairo, you can see the shadows. So here they're not interested in taking it at a particular time of day when there will be no shadows for whatever reason. Uh, and you can definitely see the difference between shadow uh, and no shadow, which is why I wanted to show that. Now, as I mentioned, one of the things that Severgain was very interested in was composition. Um, and sort of framing the scene. So we're back in the parade ground and you can see there's this ice cream seller and there's a number of people who are all standing around him. And if we zoom in on them, and this is the great thing with the album and prints is they're incredibly sharp. And as we'll, we'll see, you can blow them up to quite large sizes. Um, you can see how everybody's looking in different directions Everyone is posed in different directions, and only the little child here is looking directly uh, at us. Everybody else is sort of looking in different ways. They're standing. Some people are standing, you know, uh, in profile. Other people are in three quarters profile. Other people are, you know, are are straight on. So everybody's standing in a different way, and it's clear that he must have told everyone to do this. This isn't just people sort of randomly standing about, they're very clearly standing in particular ways. Um, and again, you can see that here with the other people in this particular picture and the ways that they're being. And again, you can see the way that Severgin uh, in other pictures, such as this one with more baggage handlers, um, 
how he's trying to do the same thing, creating this idea that there's this big line of people. He has them standing in at different different angles, looking in different directions. And so, you know, you the more you look at these pictures, the more you see, the more you can see these sort of fine details, and the more individualistic the the people appear, even though they're a part of a larger group. Um, and we see a similar thing here with these donkey riders um, that he's trying to do. And you can, again, sort of see the ghostly background of the uh, parade ground there. Now, sort of what, you know, as I say, what was he trying to do with these? What, what was the point of this? And as I say, you know, he's creating these scenes which are artificial, right, in that he's photographing a lot of them, although in this case, this caravan isn't at the parade ground, but he's photographing a lot of these things in the parade ground, in addition to going around Iran and taking pictures. So this is all part of his attempt to show the different aspects of life in Iran in the end of the 19th century. And presumably he's recreating some of these scenes because either he wants to control the scene more, or he has specific ideas about what he wants to show, and he thinks it's easier to actually recreate it in an artificial setting rather than to take pictures of real people or real things. Because as you can see here with, the, with this guy with the camel, clearly we do have a shadow in this instance. And, you know, presumably the camels are not going to be quite so easy to, uh, you know, control, right? And, you know, this sort of, you know, it's, it's clear that mm, he has much less control in scenes like this, scenes that he himself has not specifically created. Um, and this is of the Golestan Palace. So this is uh, a Qajar palace, so it's a modern palace uh, at the time. And again, he's taking pictures in public, so rather than you know in these more sort of controlled uh, outdoor situations. So you can see if we zoom in um, how we have different people sort of walking in different ways, going in different directions. So it's much less, much more spontaneous than uh, obviously, the uh, the other pic some of the other pictures are, and here we have this uh, picture, which is the street of Tehran with tramway, um, and you can see quite easily if you look the 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 tramway that the Western travelers hated, um, and indeed I think this is one of the major reasons why they said you know quick visit before it all you know becomes all modern. Um, but what's you know what's interesting about this is is that you know again he's standing on the roof looking down, and you know you have this very sort of busy scene with people on horses. Um, you know, some people are looking up at the camera. Um, and again, because it's not in this, you know, it's not being taken at noon, we actually do have uh, shadows in this case. So if we zoom in on them, um, you can see people sort of going in sort of all different directions. It's much more um, of a it's, it's much less choreographed, um, but nevertheless, it's possible that he may have asked people to stand in particular places. Um, and then you have pictures like this, which is showing the uh, uh, men praying at the call to prayer, uh, which I think is just an absolutely amazing picture because you can just see, you know, it just looks like it goes on forever. Um, and obviously he's up on the top of the roof, taking the picture down. Um, and you know it's really extremely striking, and one of these things where the more you look at it, the more details uh, you can pull out. Um, so as I say, a lot of this wasn't necessarily super spontaneous. We can see here, for example, with the storefront. Obviously, these people are posed uh, next to their goods, so presumably they are the owners of this store. Um, and you know you can see that they're, you know, sort of framing the scene, selling their various wares. Um, here, again, what's interesting is he takes this picture and it's really focused on these uh, meat sell kebab sellers. Um, but you can see here, this gentleman here who's right in the frame. Um, so very close up, which is an interesting sort of uh, framing uh, technique. Uh, and of course, it's really quite nice to see the sort of steam rising off of the the smoked uh, meat that's here and all these various people who are posed in the background uh, looking in various ways and you can see he has the kebab sellers looking straight ahead not at the camera so again you have this very sort of sense that you're in the scene actually looking at um, people uh, as they you know are going about their business whether or not they were posing specifically for this as it seems likely um, he just you know, makes you feel you're a part of this sort of 
uh, market scene. Um, and also when he's photographing monuments, he's doing very interesting things such as this mosque here at Damgan where you can see the minaret is actually bisecting the negative space that he has in the background. And not coincidentally, your eye is very much drawn to the minaret, which is the oldest part of the mosque um, and really sort of the focus of this photograph. But by doing it this way, he really draws your attention to the monument. And this picture, which we saw earlier, I think is just really demonstrates the fact that Severgin is not afraid to use this negative space as we've seen. And so he has this picture, which in a lot of ways is very stark, uh, showing two men sitting on the ramparts around Tehran. Um, and just, it seems like the view just stretches forever. Right. And, you know, you're really struck by it and you really realize this is, you know, really quite an amazing photographer, the way he puts his pictures together, the care and attention that he's using to all of this. Right. All of this is planned. All of this is thought out. Um, all of this is very deliberately set up. And even in some pictures where this is this is an interesting photograph. So this was one that honestly, when I first looked at it, I was rather confused because it said it was a mountain near Te Tehran. And I was like, well, what mountain? All I see are these rocks in front. And it wasn't until suddenly I looked in the back and I'm like, oh, there's the mountain. And this, I think, is the really interesting thing about what he does with things like landscape photography when he's photographing the Iranian landscape is that your expectations are maybe one thing versus what you actually see. So it almost, it draws you into the picture, right? So you have sort of these jagged rocks and then the mountain itself is almost an afterthought behind, which I think is a really interesting thing. So even though in theory it's framed by these rocks because they're so much darker, your view is really drawn to them uh, first. And I'm sure knowing him, this was something that was very deliberate. And we can see this too here with some of his ethnographic photography. Um, so these are in theory, um, you know, various uh, individuals from different uh, ethnic and religious groups uh, in, uh, in Iran that he documented. Now it's important to note that, you know, probably the people who were photographed in this way, these are probably not the clothes they would have worn every day. And indeed we know from uh, local photographers working in uh, Constantinople in the Ottoman Empire that in fact, not everyone who dressed up as a particular person from a particular cultural or uh, religious group was in fact from that group. But in theory, this person is a uh, from an ethnic uh, minor and religious minority, but you can see how she is framed by several doorways with people sitting sort of in them in, or sort of almost sunken in, as you can see here, uh, and sort of drawing you back. And she's really framed by these people who are at successive points. So he's here, there's a woman here, there's a man here, and then there's a little child way in the back. So it, again, he's playing around very much with the staging, with the way that this person is being presented. Um, and you can see that again with these young women too, um, the way that they're sitting, the way they're looking at you very intensely, right? The, they, they, you know, you get the sense that they want to say something to you. You're just not sure what they are. So he's creating this sense of personal connection with his subjects, which then translates into his fo photographs. Um, and you also have, uh, you know, the problem that we don't necessarily know who these people are. So uh, the photographs, he did not label them himself. So these were labeled by other people later. So our pictures were, I believe, labeled by the collector, Mary Clark, who we'll talk about in a little bit. But what this means is we don't necessarily know who these people are. So they're often identified as being from different groups. So for example, uh, we have this woman, this is in the uh, OI collection, and here she is again in the first Sankova collection. She's often identified as being Chaldean, that is Assyrian, or potentially being Kurdish, So, which are obviously two very different things. So, but we don't know. So we're often left with a certain amount of confusion as the identity of these individuals. Another group of people that uh, he liked to Severgin liked to photograph were dervishes. Uh, so these are, you know, religious uh, uh, 
individuals um, and who were, you know, made their, who, who went around begging and these various things. And you can see the begging bowl uh, here. Um, and you, there, as you can see, they look very intense. So it sort of reminds you in a way of the Shah's assassin in the other photographs. And in particular, these close-ups and these headshots really give you a sense of that uh, intensity. And it's interesting because other people like to photograph dervishes as well. So the Abdullah Frères, again, uh, out of Constantinople, also photographed the dervishes. Uh, and you can see they're actually holding the same ax here. So this is a Severgeen photo on the right in the OI collection. And the interesting thing, I think, is to see the difference between the way in which these individuals are looking at you, the way that they're photographed is a very different thing. So that's not to say that the Abdullah Frères themselves were also not skilled photographers, but I think they were trying to do something different than what Sever Dean was trying to do here. They were more interested in sort of documenting the dervishes and look at their interesting clothes and their hats here. Severgeen is really, you know, by focusing on the, the dervish boys, is really trying to, as I say, give you that sense of personal connection with the subjects. And we can see that here, too, uh, with um, the... Uh, these are either Jewish women or women from a southern Iranian tribe, uh, where if we zoom in on their expressions and how they're looking at us, we can really see how he's doing that. So although this is very much within the sort of Western European and uh, North American idea of, you know, they're, they're very, they were very interested when they went to the Middle East and North Africa in collecting these sort of ethnographic photographs, you know, these don't seem to be as, um, these seem to have a sort of more personal connection and be more done in a way that makes you look sort of beyond the costumes and pay attention to the people as uh, people. So although he's operating within Orientalist conventions, he is in a way subverting those conventions. Um, and he's also doing interesting things like, for example, this is a Qajar uh, relief. So the uh, Qajar dynasty in the 19th century uh, copied earlier Sasanian reliefs, and, which were much older and decided to make their own. Uh, and you can see what he's done here. So this is Fatah Ali Shah surrounded by some, but not all, of his sons. And you can see again here he has all of these people sort of almost echoing the presence of the people on the relief. So again, he's sort of playing between the people who are posing and the monument in the background, which I think is interesting. And this picture is much more conventional. Um, and you can see it's taken looking at the relief itself. But again, you have somebody who's actually sitting on a chair. So there's a chair that's actually carved here, um, who, you know, is sort of looking up at the pictures. Uh, and you can again see he photographs some of the same people. So these women that I showed previously, uh, here they are with, we presume their husbands. Again, we're not sure who these people are. We don't have their names. Um, and the other thing that he does, for example, is he photographs members of the Armenian community. Of course, he himself is Armenian, but he photographs them very much as just another ethnographic group. But what he does is he, again, does some very interesting things. So you can see people are standing at interesting angles. This one person, she actually has her back to us. Um, and this was actually the first photograph in the collection uh, where I realized when I was looking at it that this had to be a... Uh, this had to be someone special. I didn't know who the photographer was when uh, when these photographs were donated to the OI uh, or what later became the OI. They were not identified as being by Severgeen. But when I saw this particular picture, I thought, wait a minute, there is something very special about this photographer. And once I figured out, because there had been a brief mention in an older exhibition catalog, that the pictures were by Severgeen, that was when I realized, oh, of course, because I knew his work and I knew uh, what a talented photographer he was. Um, but of course, sometimes he takes pictures which are slightly, are more conventional. So you can see here, these are the same people actually, um, but sitting in a much more, you know, way that we would more sort of uh, recognize um, rather than, you know, as I say, with somebody who's actually got their back turned uh, to us. So one of the things with the collection, so there's 152 album and prints in one copy uh, currently in the collection. And you can see here that these are actually pasted onto cards. So they did that so that the, uh, so that basically the photograph wouldn't curl because they're very thin. And the benefit of having these on card 
rather than in an album is because is basically that um, obviously you can pass them around to larger groups of people, right? So more people can, you know, look at things sort of at the same time. So we have two cases you can see that see uh, which actually show the pictures. And uh, we were very uh, fortunate to uh, be able to restore the pictures, have them rehoused and conserved so that uh, they were basically, they were cleaned um, and this kind of thing. So they're now in, uh, they're in a better sort of storage uh, facility, uh, sort of way than they were before. Um, I was, I'm not a paper conservator, so I don't entirely understand exactly all what, what went on here, but basically they've been stabilized uh, so that they can be, you know, studied and looked at in uh, the years to come. So this was actually a very fortunate part of the uh, exhibition uh, that we were actually able to do this. Um, so as for the person who donated these, uh, they were donated by Mary Clark. And so she was part of what was a phenomenon at the, in the 19th century where basically uh, Protestant missionaries from the United States, but also elsewhere, would go to uh, the Middle East and North Africa in an attempt to convert the local population. Now, because there were issues with converting Muslims, they concentrated their efforts on converting uh, Christian minority populations to Protestantism. So in Iran, this basically translated into trying to convert the members of the Armenian and the Assyrian communities to uh, Protestantism. And the way that they did this was that they had schools that they had for the children. So the idea was you would have high quality education um, and then the children would go and presumably start to uh, convert their parents, right? Um, so she was first in, uh, in Tabriz, uh, and, which was a large, as I mentioned already, there was a large uh, Armenian community in Tabriz. So it was not surprising that there was a school there. And then she was in uh, Tehran. Uh, we don't know a lot about her, but after she returned to the United States in 1898, um, basically, she doesn't really seem to have done much with Iran after that. And in 1901, she donated her collection to the Haskell or uh, Oriental Museum. So the OI wasn't founded until 1919. And then the Haskell Oriental Museum became the Oriental Institute Museum. So this material was given to the Haskell Oriental Museum. And essentially, not a lot was done with it after that. Uh, the collection was lent out. Uh, in the 1920s, and several photographs actually went missing at that point and were not returned uh, when when the, these particular photographs were, were sent back. Um, and so the collection, as I say, so it's 152 album and prints in one copy, so 153 uh, photographs total. Uh, it was actually slightly larger um, before, but in any case, the, you know, she seems to have, I think, bought these when she was living in Tehran and probably bought them directly from Severgain's studio. Um, but again, we have really no uh, evidence for that. Um, it seems to be her who wrote on the back of the, of, the, uh, of the cards explaining what everything was. At some point, someone went along and corrected those. And this is all in the catalog. You can actually see places where all of this uh, happened because I was very interested in trying to keep the original information uh, there as much as possible. So we've talked a little bit about how this material was collected by, uh, by people like Mary Clark. So a lot of the Severdeen pictures in the collection of the OI are very well known. And that's because they were basically Western European and North American travelers would go to Iran. And if they didn't take their own photographs, uh, which most of them didn't, some of them did, um, or, and some of them took a combination of their own photographs and bought, they would buy from uh, Severgeen. And so a lot of times they bought the same pictures over and over and over again, which means basically that uh, we have a lot of information about the pictures that were purchased by Western European and North American travelers, but not as much as by the local Iranian uh, community that hasn't, that hasn't been studied uh, in as much detail. So we do have that. We know that the local Iranian community also bought Severgeen's pictures. So for example, this is the Farouz Farouz album. And it's also interesting because we can see sort of the contrast with the pictures that Mary Clark bought and how these pictures actually can give us more information. So for example, this is the picture, which is the uh, sort of main picture for the exhibition. 
uh, in the Mary Clark collection. And you can see uh, this fashionably dressed woman. We'll get to the fashion she is at in a moment. Um, and here she is again in the Furus Furus album. And you can see this picture is very different, right? Because in this one, you only see the top half of her. But in the second one, you can actually see she's in stockings. And, you know, you can actually see she has bare legs. Um, and it suddenly becomes a much different picture, right? It is conveying different things. Um, the interesting thing here is that if you think this looks like a ballerina's tutu, you would be correct. Um, basically, Nasser Adin Shah went to uh, Paris and saw ballerinas and was so taken by this that indeed this became the fashion for fashionable women in Iran to wear. Um, but you can see it the same person, but sort of in very different aspects. And indeed, with Mary Clark, we start to get a sense of her personality. So for the most part, she didn't collect violent pictures. So we have uh, only one picture that shows someone who's been executed. She tended, she didn't collect pictures like this, where it, which necessarily showed more, uh, you know, people, more skin, as it were. Um, and, you know, she also was interested in sort of monuments and ethnography and the royal family, and that's sort of what she was interested in collecting. Um, in terms of, you know, sort of looking at these pictures, you can see, again, uh, these various, you know, women, you know, being being photographed by Severgeen, but also in terms of the consumption by the Iranian community, we have them turned into postcards and changed. So seemingly, as you can see, this is a painting. And you can see here, the woman in the background actually moved. So we we're talking about how it's difficult to stand still. Clearly, she didn't. So the uh, person who painted the copy actually, you know, decided to 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 paint out the uh, the 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 moving person, you can see changed the position of her foot and a few things like this. But we know this, this postcard circulated in uh, in Iran because it's in Farsi and in French. So clearly for both uh, markets. But again, this is something that hopefully in the future we'll study more. Um, the other thing I was interested to do was look at sort of Severgeen in color because we've been looking at all these black and white images and I wanted to sort of give people a sense of what Iran would have looked like beyond kind of looking at uh, Severgeen as, you know, a black and white photographer. So basically what we did uh, is uh, Josh Tuluziak, who uh, is, works in uh, the museum prep, he actually had a computer program. And in addition, I uh, gave him pictures of Qajar artifacts, paintings, and things like this. And so he very painstakingly put this picture together. And you can see it's been blown up to, you know, basically the whole size of this wall, which again, I think points to the album and prints and the quality that you could actually do this, because it's not something you could do with digital photography. The interesting thing is people were already looking at this uh, in the end of the 19th century. So, for example, this is from the OI collection showing uh, these carpet weavers. And you can see here how this particular uh, image is a painting that someone did of the, of the picture, where, again, they left people out and did, you know, these improvements, as I mentioned, but also the colors that they picked, right? So she's wearing, in this version, a bright green skirt, for example, which I think is very interesting. So people are already we're getting the idea that, you know, they wanted to see what this looked like in color. And indeed, we have, uh, col you know, colorization techniques that were printed, where they would colorize, uh, you know, uh, postcards and things like this in order to give a sense of the colors. Um, so of course, this is not, you know, wasn't photographed in color, the color was added after the picture was developed. So here's the OI original collection, and then somebody colorized it. Uh, and you can see, so this is the Fada Ali Shah relief, again, with the people standing around it. And you can see here how the, uh, the relief itself has not been colorized. And this is just to give you a sense of what the original picture looked like. We've seen this one before. And then here's the colorized version that we blew up. So this is not necessarily the exactly how it would have looked, but I very much wanted to give people a sense of how it might have looked. And then we really sort of wanted to, what I wanted to look at was how did Severgeen depict himself? What was he trying to say? And how did he fit into this larger sort of group of Armenian uh, photographers, as well as uh, give people a sense of the catalog. And 
a slideshow of all the pictures. So you can actually stand in the exhibition for 12 minutes and 30 seconds and see all the pictures from, from the uh, collection on a uh, slideshow and they're all in the catalog as well. And I really wanted to publish the entire collection because it's not always possible for various reasons to do that. Um, and so, you know, really to give people a sense of what this was. And this is the catalog itself. So as I say, you can download it. Um, and we really tried to use uh, colors that match the wall, which come from Kajar Art, as well as this is from, uh, as we'll see shortly, Severdeen's back stamp on his photographs. This is from Kajar uh, frames, framing on photographs. And this is also Severdeen's uh, stamp, which appears on some of his pictures. So you can see here, is the catalog itself. Uh, so this has, you know, as I say, a, ver a variety of studies looking at different aspects of what I've been talking about here. Um, but the way Severgin presents himself initially as he presents himself, he writes his name in Russian. So this is perhaps not surprising. As I mentioned, he was uh, from, his family came from the Russian empire. They moved back there and his family was actually Russian Orthodox. So they were not from the Armenian church. So he very much seems to at least initially identify himself as Russian. And then on the back of his cards, he changes that to uh, signing in French and Persian. And so he did this because French was basically the language of diplomacy. It was considered the language of culture and obviously Persian because he was in, in uh, you know, in Iran. Uh, and you can see he sometimes signs his name with ease on the end. So he sort of francifies uh, his name. And he also, as you see, mentions that he is an artistic photographer or photography artistique. Now this contrast with uh, other Armenian Iranian photographers, such as Joseph Papazian, who signs the, his back stamps in uh, Persian, French, Armenian, and Russian. So he's actually utilizing his Armenian background and making it very clear. And indeed, if we look at Armenian photographers in the Ottoman Empire, we see uh, most of them actually is on the right uh, with Garabed Krikorian, uh, who is an Armenian photographer working out of Jerusalem. You can see how he has signed his back stamp in Ottoman Turkish and in, uh, in Armenian, whereas the Abdullah Frères, who are uh, very famous photographers, only sign in French and Ottoman Turkish. So it's an interesting thing to sort of see uh, the different ways in which people are doing it. And as I mentioned, he says he's a photography artistique, an artistic photographer. So he's very much saying he's not a scientific photographer, he's an artistic one. And you can see here how Gabriel Lekedjian, who's again, another Armenian photographer, this time working out of Cairo, does the same thing and says he's a, a artistic photographer. Now this map is not complete, but there's a large number of Armenian uh, photographers working in the Ottoman empire, uh, in working in Egypt, which was uh, under the control of the British in this period, uh, at least starting in the 1880s. And then uh, in, uh, there were also Armenian photographers uh, in Iran. So there's a lot of Armenian photographers. And one of the questions is why was that? Why were there so many Armenians doing photography? And there's been several suggestions. One is that a lot of them were chemists or doctors. So they would have had access and understood the chemicals that they were, that were necessary to do photography in this period. It was quite a complex process. Other suggestions have been because they were Christian, they were often used as intermediaries between uh, sort of the local Muslim population and the visiting uh, Western European and North American travelers. So there's also that possibility that they sort of occupy this very interesting sort of liminal zone. We're not really sure why, but but basically Severgin is part of this wider phenomenon. Uh, and you can see here some of Gerbert Krikorian's pictures uh, here, uh, as well as some by, again, here's Gabriel Lekedjian as well. Um, and he, Gabriel Ketching was also a painter. So like Severdeen, he was trained as an artist, um, but he actually, some of his pictures have actually uh, survived, uh, unlike Severdeen's who, as far as I know, we don't know what any of them are. And Lekedjian is interesting because he actually participates in the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. So he actually is in, uh, is actually in Chicago uh, in 1893, which is, which is interesting. Here's his, his storefront on the Cairo street. Now, then uh, I, you might have noticed there was a picture of a train and again uh, by Severgin. And so again, uh, the purpose of sort of showing this particular picture was to talk about sort of Severgin's interest in 
uh, modernity and depicting a modern Iran, which, as I mentioned, was not something that Western European and North American travelers were that interested in. Um, but you can see also what he does here is very interesting with the space. He implies that this train is very long when, in fact, it stops just right at the end of this picture. But again, he's doing this thing where he's sort of tricking your mind into thinking that there's more there than there is. And you can actually see that on this picture that, yeah, this train is not that long. Um, and then finally, uh, what we wanted to do was really look at Severgin's legacy and how that continues. So not just how we appreciate his pictures, as we've been talking about, but also how modern artists and contemporary artists have responded to Severgin. So to do that, we looked primarily, we primarily exhibited the work of Yasaman Ameri, who is a Canadian uh, American, uh, Arme uh, that Canadian Iranian artist uh, who, uh, is based in uh, Montreal. And she uh, has a work called The Inheritance of which these pictures are a part of. And really what she was interested to do was the pictures uh, were of, of, of a number of women. So these are Qajar photographs of women. And she really wanted to reimagine these women and find their story because these women are basically anonymous. Uh, we don't know who they are. They have names, but these probably aren't their names. Uh, and they, you know, she wanted to give them a past and put them in a new environment and therefore make us start to think about um, who these women might have been. So this I found to be extremely helpful when I was trying to think about what Severgain was trying to do and who the people were, right? What was really going on? Um, and so these are some more of the pictures, which you can see um, how they, these women have been put into these new spaces and therefore given a new uh, identity. And then uh, also you can see down here, we have some pictures by uh, Mahdi Sai of uh, the Afro-Iranian community in Iran. So these are primarily descendants of uh, enslaved individuals from East Africa who were brought to Iran in the 19th century. Um, and he explicitly says in his work that he's trying to uh, imitate Severgin's pictures and the way Severgin photographed people. So this was really, you know, the idea was to look at how Severgin's legacy uh, lives on to this day. So this was pretty much what I wanted to talk about. I hope that you have a chance to come to the OI or view the virtual exhibition, or perhaps, you know, if you're interested to visit the, uh, some of the website uh, or become an OI member. And I just like to end by thanking the uh, people who helped support the exhibition and its catalog, the American Institute of Iranian Studies, the Dolores Zorab Liebman Fund, and the Knights of Artan Fund for Armenian Studies and the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, the NASR. So thank you. Thank you, Tasha. Um, Boy, that was a trip to another place in time. Um, thank you very much. That's so interesting. The images are really beautiful and they come across very well on the computer screen. Um, uh, I hope to see them in person someday. Um, I don't see any questions in the, in the Q&A at this point, but I did have a few questions of my own. Um, you said right at the beginning that a lot of his images were destroyed and I wondered how you know that and why they might have been destroyed. Yeah, so this had to do with uh, there was uh, uh, a lot of political instability uh, in Iran at the beginning of the 20th century. And so there was there was rioting and things that went on in Tehran. And as a result, his studio was uh, was was burned and his negatives were destroyed. So that's how that's how we know that is that we know that 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 occurred. And so um about i believe 2000 were were saved and then uh, after the fall of the Qajars, uh the uh you know the his pho pho photographs sort of went out of style and uh were considered not really mm, uh, you know, the kind of thing people wanted to show, which is interesting because, you know, I've been going on about, oh, she was showing modernity and things like this, which, yeah, at the end of the 19th century, but by the time you get into, say, the 20s, you know, it's it's no longer like, you know, modern, right? So so the actual, the, the government actually, his, his negatives were seized um, because it was considered this was not the kind of Iran they wanted to show, and then about 700 of them were returned, and those are the ones that ended up uh, in the first Sackler. So, so this is how we know that his his negatives were destroyed, um, you know, through these or you know confiscated, basically. And that that was during his lifetime, then, right? Yes, yes, he was alive. Mm -hmm. 
what a what a crushing thing to have your life's work yes Gosh. i think it would have been yes yeah um uh thank you um i also wondered um are there any collection significant collections of silver gains work elsewhere or is is what or institute have has you know basically it no no so there's there's a lot uh so the biggest collection is the first sackler and they have it i think all digitized right. now online so there's several thousand uh, either they have the glass negatives, but they also have a lot of prints from a variety of different collections, which they have acquired. Uh, there's uh, collections. Uh, so the Getty Museum has a collection. Uh, the uh, Leiden Museum of Ethnology, as well as the Leiden right. University have collections. The Rijksmuseum, Victoria and Albert Museum, the Kunstkamera in St. Petersburg, uh, the Golestan Palace Museum in Iran. Um, so there's things in Zurich. Uh, you know, it's sort of gotten everywhere. So there's there's a lot of pictures, and this is why uh, with the, my photographs, most of the photographs I have are published in other collections. Um, so that was one of the things that was mm -hmm. interesting. Was you know these are sort of it's it's interesting because it's like yet another picture of the same you know and but some of them are cropped and some of them aren't. So that even when you have the same picture in different collections, they're actually different sometimes. So it's it's interesting sort of to see. Okay, and where did you say that? Where's the Sackler Friars? Um, uh, Washington, D.C. Oh, okay. Is it part of a larger institution or is it? Uh, it's, it's part of the Smithsonian. So it's now known as the Museum of Asian Art, but uh, officially it's still the first Sackler. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, you you touched on this toward the end, but um, I just wanted to ask again a little bit about um, what is Iranian awareness now of Sabagin and, and perhaps the other Armenian photographers at the time? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, reputation and what's the level of consciousness of their work? Yeah, I mean, there's been uh, work done by a number of Iranian scholars, which have been very useful looking at sort of the history of Qajar uh, photography. There were some, not surprisingly, some of the earliest people to actually study this uh, extensively. So, for example, if you're interested in looking at uh, sort of Iranian art beyond some of the more famous people like Severdeen, there is uh, Iranian scholars who sort of assembled, you know, uh, sort of, you know, photographs and, you know, brief biographies of these people. There's also been a number of very helpful, from my point of view, uh, studies looking at things like Qajar frames and signatures on photographs, which was excessively helpful because, again, nobody had done that uh, before, uh, as well as things like Qajar postcards. So like the postcard, the postcards I was showing were from, uh, that's from an, uh, an Iranian uh, publication. One of the difficulties, however, is uh, quite frankly, is uh, obtaining these uh, these publications. They're just it's very difficult, uh, and of course they're also in Farsi. So that's the other thing that makes them you know less accessible, even when you can get a hold of them. Um, but yeah, there's definitely you know an awareness and appreciation in Iran of Severdin's work, and they uh, seem to there, and also of other uh, photographers as well. Um, there's been films and other things on. Uh, there was a film that was done on uh, a f Iranian Armenian photographer working out of Tabriz, who is descended from a famous. Uh, Armenian Iranian photographer who had a collection and what was he going to do with it? So there's there's been a variety of different sorts of presentations of this material, um, which have which have come out of Iran that have, that are very helpful. There's still of course a lot to do, um, but I think they they have you know huge collections that we don't you know we really don't even know about you know. Is this one of the first um, uh, Severgain oriented uh, exhibits in the United States? The just um, on him. So, I mean, as as I sort of was at the beginning, uh, so the Severgin and the Persian image, which uh, came out in the late 90s from the first Sackler, was really the first one to focus on him. Um, the other exhibitions I was talking about, like the NYU one uh, and the Harvard Art Museum one, those were focusing not just on Severgin. So, um, so, so there have been a, a number of exhibitions, um, but they've sort of taken different tacks. So so like mine, the for Sackler exhibition focused just on Severgain. Other ones have said, now we're going to look at Kajar photography or we're going to look at Kajar sort of art more generally and technology, you know, this kind of thing. So there's been there's been a number of different things um, that have taken sort of different uh, approaches. 
Okay. Uh, we have a participant who um, has a question here. Uh, mm -hmm. Was there any tension in that era between portrait photography and Islamic prohibitions on images of people? Right. Um, yeah, well, so there were some Islamic scholars who didn't like uh, uh, photography, but there were other Islamic scholars who had absolutely no problem with it. Um, this is the thing with Islamic art that I think people should keep in mind is that from the beginning of Islamic art, that is in the seventh century, they depicted figural images. Um, and so some people didn't like those and other people had no problem with them and figural imagery continues to be produced throughout the Islamic world and throughout Islamic art. So obviously there's also people who are more like, okay, let's do things that are geometric and this kind of thing. But there doesn't really seem to have been a lot of uh, problem with this. I mean, we have very early photography of uh, Mecca and Medina, including pictures of pilgrims, for example, taken by uh, a Muslim photographer who happened to be Egyptian. We have uh, someone who's local to uh, what is now Saudi Arabia, who gets trained up as a photographer and takes similar pictures. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't really seem to have been that big of an issue. As I say, there were some people who didn't like it, but they seem to have been in the definite minority uh, on that. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Roger, um, who says, all of the photos you showed appeared to be intended for public consumption. Do any photos exist that show a more private life, family, personal events, et cetera, of the photographer? Yeah, so yeah, no, that's a great question. So yeah, we don't have those pictures and that's because those weren't for sale, right? We do have some studio things that look like they started out as studio pho photographs by uh, private individuals who were sort of ethnic minorities that then get distributed widely. Um, but we also have very definite private photography by Severgain. I didn't show it here because it's not part of our collection, but we have pictures that he took of uh, other of sort of that, that it's clear people came and they posed and you know they're they're wearing uh, oftentimes wearing Western clothing uh, and you know very clearly posing for formal photographs that they would have uh, distributed as cartes de visite for uh, for their uh, you know to their friends and family right so he definitely was also doing studio photography at the same time that hasn't been looked at in as much detail simply because those are not the pictures that we have. Uh, in the collections, because that's not what people, you know, were had available to buy. But there were definitely private pictures. And indeed, most of these local photographers, they would sell their, you know, more what we say is like tourist photography, right, to the tourists who came, particularly in the Ottoman Empire, where you have a lot more tourists than you have uh, visiting Iran um, in this period. And, um, you know, the other way that they would earn money would be to photograph local people or indeed foreigners would actually come and get their photographs taken. And indeed, we do have pictures that Severgin took of sort of more of foreigners, which seem to have then been turned into photographs that were more widely distributed. So there's some interesting things uh, going on there. But it sounds like you don't know of any that show his family or his life. Uh, well, the picture I showed in the beginning was of him, and we have a couple oh. pictures of his family. Um, but so we do have some pictures of him, but not a lot. No. Yeah. Okay, great. And finally, um, I would like to ask, um, what are some of your other interests? You won't be having to think Severgin morning, noon, and night now um, that the exhibit is winding down. Um, what else do you study? Yeah, so I mean, my sort of interest is in, uh, so I mean, my, my background is, you know, I worked on sort of, you know, Byzantine and Islamic material, so sort of medieval material, I'm very interested in sort of how people project their identity through material culture, and how we can see signs of sort of that, and you know, how historical events can potentially uh, impact that material culture. Um, but I'm also interested in sort of looking at, mm, interconnections between regions so not and sort of looking at different aspects of places that maybe people haven't thought about so for example last year um, in November I did a class on uh, Nubian queens so this is uh, first millennium BCE to first early first millennium CE queens in Nubia so Nubia is this area that's uh, southern Egypt northern uh, Sudan now and these were very powerful women but not this is not a 
sort of area that a lot of people have studied in detail. So I thought it would be very interesting to do that and look at that. So, so I'm also sort of interested in sort of looking at these areas and, you know, bringing to light things that maybe people haven't thought about. So whether that's Severgeen or whether that's, as I say, things looking in other regions, other time periods, and looking at these interconnections uh, across uh, sort of areas and times. Fascinating. Well, we'll look forward to uh, seeing, seeing more of your discoveries. Um, I, I do uh, want to encourage people who can, to either go to the exhibit, if you can, um, before December 23rd in person, or I've looked at the virtual exhibit on the, on the Oriental Institute website, and it's very well done. And you can take your time looking through all the images, of course, and, and it's, a, it's a good experience. And it's easy to find on the Oriental Institute website. So um, Tasha Bartostrasse, thank you so much for your time tonight. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me and giving me an opportunity to talk about Severgeen, which I always very much enjoy doing. <laughs> All right. Thanks for attending, everybody. Good night. <laughs>